What has happened about this cartoon crisis and what it has changed in my life? Well, I I have never <laughs> I have never thought it thought of it before. She just was here. As a cartoonist, I have experienced that if you enter the field of religion and the field of symbols, then you will very soon get into trouble. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم A resurgence of religion is underway in the world. That's the observation of a number of critics and analysts. The question is, how will this renaissance play out? Will it be fundamentalist and violent? Or a peaceable search for the meaning of life, for answers not found in the broadly shared enlightenment values of secular societies? The mosque is a place of calm and serene spirituality. The visitor meditates here. The word holy doesn't exist in our culture, nor does the idea of attributing holiness to an infallible individual. Holiness is not an Islamic concept. It is a Western ecclesiastical concept. At the center of every religious community is an intense core. Its members identify with that core so deeply that it makes them vulnerable to perceived offense. I think it's worth occasionally asking what can be achieved by poking into that fervent core. Everything that is important to me, that I take very seriously, is open to ridicule. And in the case of Christianity, you could say the original idea of an almighty God who becomes a man, namely Jesus, who then dies on the cross in an act that it is said to redeem the world, that is something both deeply serious and completely ludicrous. I'd like to leave it to God to decide whether something is blasphemous or not. I always find it presumptuous and lacking in humility when people pass judgment and label a remark as blasphemous or the like. In my opinion, God alone can judge these things. What do people value so much that they feel hurt when it's ridiculed? It was once taboo to offend God. It was considered blasphemy. Is that still the case today, in an age when religion has to stand its ground against secularism? In the Middle Ages, life was dominated by religion and the idea of salvation based on merit. Individuals who revered God went to heaven. Those who offended him burned in hell for all eternity. In secular societies, belief in God is a personal matter. Outwardly, individuals are seen to aspire to ideals like success and self-fulfillment. It's an emancipation that has come at a cost. Loss of meaning, loneliness, despondency, vague sensibilities that pursue arbitrary goals and can suddenly give way to supercharged emotion. The past decades have shown that when religion plays a role on the global stage, it is often as a manifestation of collective rage over a perceived blasphemy. In a few cases, it was triggered by cartoons or caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, published in newspapers or magazines like the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. 
The cartoons unleashed a storm of protest by Muslims. A few years later, Islamist terrorists targeted the magazine's Paris offices. Twelve people were killed in this attack alone. The attack on Charlie Hebdo marked the horrific climax of a conflict over free speech that has festered for three decades. The massacre sent shockwaves around the world and was followed by an international outpouring of sympathy. Hundreds of thousands turned out to support freedom of expression in solidarity demonstrations. But within days, other voices were raised to ask whether more respect shouldn't be shown toward religious sensibilities. There was a great show of solidarity in the Western world, which suddenly felt called upon to defend the values of the Enlightenment. On the other hand, there are equally large communities of people who feel offended by a caricature that they have never themselves seen but about which they have been religiously informed. In the medium term, the response to the events in Paris targeting Charlie Hebdo appear to show that there is self-doubt in Western societies as to whether freedom of expression, press freedom, and the freedom of caricature are in fact abstract and infinite. The reactions to Charlie Hebdo are interesting inasmuch as we are presented with two normative ideas that are actually contradictory. That is a very contemporary phenomenon. On the one hand, you have absolute freedom of expression. You mustn't allow yourself to be restricted in any way by anyone, regardless of the opinion or mode of expression. On the other hand, there is this idea that religious feelings may not be challenged, or at least not in a fashion deemed inappropriate. The blasphemy controversy erupted in the late 1980s with the publication of Salman Rushdie's novel The Satanic Verses. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa calling for the author's execution for writing the novel deemed offensive to Islam. When you look at developments in Iran and many other countries in the region, then you'll see that in the 1970s they were on a course of westernization, and revolutionary movements there were based primarily on two ideologies. One was Marxism, the other Islam. Both were capable of generating collective movements. Both were also in a position to lay claim to blasphemies. What kind of an ideology maintains that a westernized Indian author can write a novel that threatens the salvation of an entire world religion. What kind of an ideology really believes that social order will collapse if women are allowed into soccer stadiums? Twenty-five years later, a short film called Submission triggered another wave of outrage. The film presents the stories of abused Muslim women who call on Allah for help. Oh, Allah. Most High, you say that men are the protectors and maintainers of women because you have given the one more strength than the other. I feel at least once a week the strength of my husband's fist on my face. <laughs> Most high. Life with my husband is hard to bear, but I submit my will to you. Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh sought to draw attention to violence against Muslim women, but some considered the film confrontational and blasphemous. Shortly after it aired on Dutch television, van Gogh was shot and stabbed to death by a radical Islamist. The following year, Danish cartoonist Kurt Vestergaard became the focus of an international uproar. His caricature depicting Muhammad with a bomb in his turban was first published by a Danish newspaper. 
Violent protests erupted in numerous Islamic countries. Hundreds died in the unrest. A fatwa was also issued calling for Vestergaard's death and it has not been lifted. We got all very, very scared. For my part, my house was attacked from one of the from a terrorists, and uh, but I escaped because we have here in the house a, a safety, a security room. So this saved me, and uh, now I'm living all the time with uh, agents from uh, what we would call the secret service. The boys is in the back room. I think there is perhaps something you may call ideal politics, but there is also something called real politics. And uh, of course we were supported very much from the Danish politicians, but uh, in the real world, I think we have only won half a victory because we have come to a point where it is, um, what can I say, freedom of speech, but. Kurt Vestergaard was seeking to illustrate a problem associated with the politicization of Islam. He paid the price with his personal freedom. Words, images and symbols are at the core of the blasphemy debate. What to some is a wry observation or inspired punchline can be deeply offensive to others and in the digital age easily lead to chaos. Words, images and symbols were the things that dominated Christian life back in the Middle Ages. Evidence of this can be seen in the German city of Cologne. A key religious centre in medieval times, it presented an antithesis of our modern-day, rather abstract notion of God. Until long after the Middle Ages, people in Europe presumably lived according to the premise that religious phenomena were real, existent, palpable, and had to be revered. Because the picture or sculpture harbored, if you so wish, a kind of sacred energy. People believed that God was not just a matter of faith or of conviction, but rather a part of the environment or the universe in which one lives. Since the 14th and 15th centuries, there has been a slow shift, and we can in fact observe that since the Reformation, and even more so since the Enlightenment, there has been an increasing emphasis on the question of what things mean. In other words, religion has become increasingly abstract. In medieval Christianity, devotion to God went hand in hand with a sensory and tangible veneration of saints and relics. Heaven and hell were depicted in dramatic colors. Blasphemy was a crime committed only by heretics, the harbingers of hell. Christianity was founded on the mystery of the cross of Christ. A symbol of the Savior's sacrifice for the salvation of humankind, it became the single visual identifier of the Christian faith. But it has also provoked representations viewed as blasphemous and the prosecution of those responsible. The earliest known blasphemous representation of Christ is a 3rd century graffiti found on the Palatine Hill in Rome, Jesus with the head of a donkey. The image is echoed in a 1926 work by the German painter George Gross that depicts Jesus on the cross wearing a gas mask. Gross painted it after the First World War, which saw the first large-scale use of chemical weapons. His contemporary Otto Dix had fought on the front and could not forget the horrors of the trenches. He showed them with unflinching realism. A few years later, George Gross used this motif for his Christ with a gas mask. Widely viewed as a provocation, it sparked the start of the modern-day blasphemy debate. 
Christ with a gas mask is viewed today as the very opposite of blasphemy. It's a rousing cry to express that this is happening in the here and now. History is repeating itself. It's the attempt to rescue something from the inner core of religion. If religion wants to survive spirituality, then it has to allow room for voices that challenge its structures, even if that is through blasphemy. But a view took shape that would inform the debate. Blasphemy became a charge that could be leveled against artists, even if they themselves did not view their work as blasphemous. George Gross's caricatures soon landed him in court, on charges of offending public order. His conviction was later overturned. Another painting, another scandal. Max Ernst's The Blessed Virgin chastises the infant Jesus before three witnesses. It too was exhibited in 1926, not in Germany, but in Paris. While it shocked the public, Ernst was not prosecuted. Designed to maintain government neutrality in religious affairs, France's secularism has kept the charge of blasphemy out of the courts. George Gross breathed new life into the art of the caricature. It became the medium of the blasphemy debate and remains so until today. Not without reasons. The focus of the outrage has shifted. That's probably due to the fact that life in our culture is lived at a high level of excitability. So responses must be immediate and impassioned before the moment has passed. And the medium of the caricature is particularly well suited because a cartoon is generally an ad hoc response to a specific event. So the intention, if you like, is a swift, short-term, provocative response. The Caricature Museum in Frankfurt is also the headquarters of the German satirical magazine Titanic. Here it is evident to any visitor that the art of caricature is the contemporary form of religious criticism. Religious criticism has actually seen its day. It's something from the past and not something we need to keep doing. There's nothing more to say, but it is worth keeping an eye on church institutions and current religious cultures. When I hear the word blasphemy, I always think of the drawings by Robert Gerhardt, who features prominently here at the Caricature Museum. His play on the word blasphemy, blas in Germany means blow. We ourselves have never faced such an accusation. I can't define it. Blasphemy is not on my radar. By the way, the cathedral next door has a way of working itself into every interview. That's Frankfurt Cathedral. We're used to it. Here's a nice picture that caused a huge stir. It shows a bishop in front of a cross, and you can't really tell what he's doing. There was a huge outcry from the Catholic Church that purported to see something quite particular here. We think it looks as though the cross is being cleaned. There seems to be other interpretations, but they remain a mystery to us. Humor requires victims to work. A joke always has a victim. And when that victim is already weak, it becomes malicious. We no longer feel like laughing. That's when you need to find something really powerful, something influential, to justify the way we approach satire. We are the small dialectical antidote to public opinion. And because we are small, we can use a mallet, the big guns, to have a go at people. This next image is a reference to the Vatican leak scandal. A Vatican employee passed on information to the press. And that caused a major uproar because the Pope himself complained. That was the first time in history that God's representative, so to speak, had taken legal action. 
denjenigen so bewusst wurde, dass das schwierig wird, wenn man dann vor Gericht And when they realized that it would be a problem if God's representative went to court and lost, they quickly withdrew the suit. Oder nicht die Recht bekommt, dann hat man ein Problem. Deswegen haben sie ganz schnell diese Klage zurückgezogen. Today, when artists and the media take on religion, they use and incorporate religious motifs. It's no longer God and religion that are up for criticism, but rather church institutions and the double moral standards that they at times apply. That is particularly true in Austria. Vienna, like almost no other city, has a schizophrenic relationship between Catholic tradition and a recalcitrant avant-garde art scene. A paragraph outlawing blasphemy remained in the country's penal code up until 1975, under which offending the church was a punishable crime. It's the opposite of France or the United States, where religion, despite the separation of church and state, is a deeply integral part of everyday life. This is the environment in which Austrian cartoonist Gerhard Harderer honed his skills. After publishing a book entitled The Life of Jesus, the artist faced accusations of blasphemy and widespread hostility. As an agnostic, I never had a reason to attack religious myths. I was primarily interested in the way the churches presented them. I wondered if it was possible to dismantle the big ideas that are based on a hypocritical, idyllic ideal by presenting images that no one can really bear to look at. And I always felt the need to illustrate these ideas with different content, in juxtaposition to the superficially radiant, idyllic mode of representation. And I didn't just use this approach to make a book. I also repeatedly used it for cartoons. It helped me let off steam and relieve the mounting pressure in my skull, and that's the way I cleansed myself. The term blasphemy is actually a very pliable term. As a rational person firmly grounded in secular society, I have also given a lot of thought to phenomena like the power of the Catholic Church. It's something any rational person does. I was surprised by the vehemence of the reaction, the accusations in my case of blasphemy and profanity. To me, that's a strategy of warfare. In postmodern society, the cultural approach to religion is playful. It's no longer possible to shock anyone with this kind of thing. Having said that, I do believe that pop culture appropriates the symbols of religion, incorporating them into its own language. Pop culture is all about appropriation. Whites appropriate black music, heterosexuals appropriate gay codes, and so on. So why should that stop when it comes to Christianity or other religions? What we've seen is a kind of civilized deregulation of religious imagery. Anything goes. In this restriction-free zone, I believe that blasphemy would generally be tolerated and in a liberal society would only become apparent if action were taken by aggrieved parties. And that's a totally different stance from the one that exists in non-liberal societies. Would that suffice? 
Liberal democracies experienced firsthand what happens when large numbers of Muslims interpreted blasphemy as an offense against Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Even if only a minority responded with violence, the conflict raised the specter of a clash of religions, with the everything goes of Western secularism on the one side and Islam's evidently very unambiguous understanding of God and correspondingly strong reaction on the other. This may be a good point to look back on the origins of the major religions. The notion of blasphemy only emerged with monotheism, the belief in the existence of a singular God. At first, there was this belief in the magical spirit world, the idea that gods were everywhere. Blasphemy didn't come into play. Then there was the idea of many gods in a pantheon. And it's also hard to be blasphemous in that setup, because if I offend one god, chances are good that I'm siding with another. That changed with the awakening of a belief in one divine ruler of the heavens, the god of creation. Among the rules laid down by God, two are particularly worth noting. Do not take the name of God in vain, and do not make idols. It was only this monotheistic notion of a God as the beginning and end of all things that introduced the idea that I may neither name nor depict him. In fundamentalist terms, one could say that every image, every pronouncement is blasphemous. It's the same in Islam as in the other two major religions. One is not allowed to create an image of God. That has quite simply to do with the fact that one cannot grasp God. We believe in a creative power, and there is nothing but this creative power. There is no God but God, or there is nothing else but God. And one must also understand that the term Allah is not specifically Islamic. Christian Arabs also talk about Allah. The word simply means God. Every individual is free to come up with his or her own ideas about God. I think most people can't get by without certain ideas. But ultimately, it is a basic tenet of the Quran and the Islamic faith that life originated from a specific act of creation. Anyone who challenges the notion of an intangible God is guilty of blasphemy. God's presence can only be experienced by those who encounter him in the sacred texts, the Torah, the Bible and the Quran. Yet exposure to the books alone is no guarantee against an abuse of power. The presence of God in scripture, something shared by the three monotheistic religions, is interesting because it implies two things. Scripture, the written word, has a dual function. On the one hand, it's very precise, and on the other, very imprecise. It's precise because what's written is what's written. At the same time, what's written is open to many interpretations. It demands different interpretations. So that is the paradox inherent in the three religions. The Torah is the central reference of Judaism, and the Torah gave rise to the Christian Bible, and the Bible gave rise to the Quran which refers repeatedly to the Bible. The concept of blasphemy is a concept appropriated by those in power. The rabbinate is the body that in the Judaic tradition has the authority of interpretation, and it decides what is good and what is bad. It's the religious authorities in Islam, Judaism and Christianity that determine what is blasphemous and what is not. The Quran is the word of God. It was revealed to the Prophet over the course of 23 years, and he directly passed it on to his companions. 
The Quran is a guideline for us, which ensures there is always light shining on our path. By knowing the Quran well, you illuminate your path. It is the light. The first rule of Islam is read. Reading eliminates ignorance. Judaism is a religion that is subject to continuous review, and I would venture to maintain that because of that, the focus of anything that could be blasphemed is vague. But it's different in Islam. There, Allah is viewed as the source of a text that allows no room for commentary and interpretation at least not of a critical nature. The Quran is, as such, the literal word of Allah, revealed through the Prophet. Christianity differs from the other monotheistic religions in that it has a Trinitarian structure. Jesus says, he who sees me sees the Father. That means he is actually the gateway, the human filter. And we know from experience that the insults and offenses that arise from this are virtually automatically projected onto God via the Jesus filter. The Trinity widens the scope for blasphemy. This susceptibility is also apparent in the relationship between the three world religions. Are followers of a different faith automatically blasphemous? Islamic Spain is an historic example of a coexistence between Muslims, Christians and Jews. Moors from Morocco conquered the sparsely populated region of Andalusia in the 8th century and made their mark on everyday life just like the Jews who settled in nearby Cordoba. Architecture, the arts and sciences flourished, but tensions existed even then, and that gave rise to doubts that this historic model could serve as a blueprint for today's conflict between religion and secularism. Coexistence is a modern concept. Cordoba is the city where three cultures live peacefully side by side, where a Christian embraces a Muslim and a Muslim embraces a Jew. No. 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 The romantic notion that a mosque is a center of peace, a church, a temple of love, and a synagogue, a place of prayer, does not correspond to the historic reality. Mosques, churches, and synagogues have always been centers of power and authority. It's true that they coexisted, because they were all in one place, but it wasn't a peaceful coexistence. I don't think you can view the coexistence between two religions outside of the historical and current context. Coexistence is always hard. And the Christians in particular have been subject to relentless and violent persecution in almost all Muslim-majority countries. One open question in the current blasphemy debate is this. Why did Islam and Christianity develop in such different directions and at such a different pace? The Alhambra in Granada testifies to an eventful past and a golden age of Islamic culture. The buildings erected under the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, on the other hand, are evidence of the power transfer. The reconquest of Andalusia was as violent as the medieval crusades and the Islamic invasion of Spain. The Reconquista marked a watershed, checking Islamic expansion into Western Europe. When Granada's Muslim ruler handed over the keys to the city in 1492, Christianity was setting off on a road towards the Reformation and the era of the Enlightenment.
When discussing these divergent paths of development, the conversation shouldn't be limited to Spain. It needs to be viewed in a global context. Then we see that Christianity, or Christian society, developed according to the understanding of religion and the relationship between state and religion. That is the key. That same development did not take place in Islamic culture. In its case, there is still a very close relationship between state and religion, which is reminiscent of Christianity in the Middle Ages. Of the three monotheistic religions, Islam is the youngest the apotheosis, actually, of monotheism. It's difficult to assess the extent to which Islam remained a relatively tolerant religion, and then over the course of the centuries became disconnected, or was undocked, from the developmental forces that shaped Europe, the process of modernization, and so on. Of course, Islam reached a zenith in philosophy and theology as well. But this impetus evidently lost steam over time, resulting in a cultural setback, due in part perhaps to a military setback, particularly after the Reconquista. And a religion that feels threatened is going to become uncomfortable. In Cordoba, the Christian cathedral towers with almost imperial superiority over the great mosque it replaced. An allegory for the current situation? On the one side, the Enlightenment ideals of reason and unfettered thinking. On the other, Islam, a religion that rejects the process of secularization. I don't believe it's enough, if you take faith seriously, to keep hearkening back to the mystery of faith. In my view, faith must be tested in the crucible of reason. That means I have to use reason to try to grasp and articulate difficult issues. Obviously, our reason is limited and can lead us down many roads, but that doesn't excuse us from a duty to try. A religion guided by reason and a faith relegated to the private sphere. Are these guiding principles enough to placate religious fanatics and defuse the global conflict over blasphemy? The first case of blasphemy related by the Bible is the story of the Israelites dancing around the golden calf. A vengeful God severely punished this misconduct. This painting by the German expressionist Emil Nolde could sum up the situation today. While one group dances around the golden calf of the next big thing, another dances around the golden calf of religious fervor. Not exactly a recipe for peaceful coexistence. The first blasphemy laws were designed to protect God himself. In the next step, which happened during the Enlightenment, it became clear that this presented a problem. That's when what we call religious protection came into play. So it was no longer God who was being protected, but religion. Why do you protect religion? Because you assume that religion lends societies a moral stability. In places where religion is strong, morality in society is also strong. We know from painful experience that this is not true. It is not the case that highly religious societies also exhibit strong moral stability. I want the cross! So why should blasphemy be censored, the third aspect, and we're again venturing deep into the realm of psychology, is that religious sensibilities are violated. A feeling arises through provocation and agitation. One no longer has to refer to God or religion. This is about people with religious sensibilities. That's extremely dangerous, because neither the excitability of emotions nor the reasons why people feel the need to take religious offense are things that can be gauged. 
sind das ebenso wenig. Is there a path to peaceful coexistence in times of media frenzy and cynicism? A coexistence where we bear with equanimity an attack on values and standards we hold sacred or dear? Where we allow people to practice their religion without forfeiting the achievements of the Enlightenment? For me personally, for me personally, blasphemy has something to do with not standing up to what you have recognized as right. I also believe it is blasphemous not to make use of the talents that you were given by God. The question is, do we handle religious sensibilities and images in the same way as we do all other types of feelings and images? I consider myself a religiously open-minded person, but at the same time, I'm also a liberal-minded citizen. And it doesn't seem to me that a religion is suited to the modern world if it feels shaken to its core by inappropriate images of its key figures or teachings. So even with a certain openness to religion, I would always give precedence to my identity as a citizen. The minute you approach a myth, whether as an Enlightenment philosopher, a critic, an aesthete, or whatever, the myth begins to fall apart. Well, maybe the best we can hope for is that we can preserve religions as beautiful artworks. Then we will treat them with the same care as we treat artworks. You don't destroy works of art, you relate to them in a creative manner. You observe them, see how they evolve, the way they change, and sometimes, when the guards aren't looking, you touch them.